G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett. I'm Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our webinar series. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, if you are anywhere between about Geelong and Canberra, I hope uh, you've made it through that little earthquake we had okay. Mm. Wasn't too bad here. Things look a bit more dire in Melbourne, but hopefully no one was hurt and I hope you're all safe out there. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I live and work on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. Sovereignty was never ceded. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land and I want to pay my respects to Elders past and present. Uh, the Australia Institute does do these webinars at least weekly but days and times do vary so make sure you head on over to australiainstitute.org.au to find out about all our upcoming webinars. Um, we've got Pole Position next week where we talk to Guardian Australia and Essential Media uh, and that'll be covering off on the new nuclear submarines deal next week. Just a few tips before we begin today to help things run smoothly. If you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should be able to see a Q&A button. You can type in questions for the panel there uh, and upvote questions and make comments on other people's questions as well. Please keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we'll have to boot you out. And finally, a reminder that this discussion is being recorded. You'll find it up on the Australia Institute's YouTube channel within the next 24 hours if you have to duck out for any reason. So I'm really excited about today's webinar, journalism. That's my background. I trained as a journalist and worked in the press gallery for a little while. And good public interest journalism is a public good, like the fire brigade, public health, or street lighting. Um, it acts as a check and balance, and it's an important part of any healthy democracy. And today's webinar is about Australia's media landscape. Um, Australia's got one of the world's most concentrated media markets, particularly its newspapers. In about 2016, just four companies, News Corp, Fairfax, uh, now nine, Seven West Media and APN News and Media were estimated to account for more than 90% of newspaper industry revenue and TV and radio are pretty much concentrated in terms of media ownership as well. And the pandemic has certainly only made this trend worse with the Public Interest Journalism Initiative reporting that more than 150 newsrooms closed temporarily or for good since early 2019. Worse still, Australia has cut funding to the public broadcaster, most notably the ABC, and our government has regularly prosecuted whistleblowers, while the AFP has raided the homes and offices of journalists. So there's a lot happening in Australian media. And the Nordic countries, I think, offer us a, real different, a really different example that we can look to. One covered in a chapter of the new book, The Nordic Edge, here, that you can see published by Melbourne University Press. Um, the chapter on media diversity was co-written by yours truly and Dr. Maria Ray. Um, and today, joining us to talk about some of the possibility uh, policy possibilities offered by the Nordic countries, I'm joined by Green Senator Sarah Hanson-Young, Chair of the Senate Inquiry into Media Diversity in Australia by Professor Andrew Scott, Convener of the Nordic Policy Centre at the Australia Institute and Professor of Politics and Policy at Deakin University. He's also co-editor of The Nordic Edge and author of previous book, The Northern, Northern Lights. And my co-author is Dr. Maria Ray, Senior Lecturer in Politics and Policy at Deakin University. Welcome, Sarah, Andrew and Maria. Thanks so much for joining me today. Sarah, I'll start with you. You're the chair of the Senate Inquiry into Media Diversity, and you were going to help us launch uh, this book in <laughs> Adelaide before we all got locked down. Um, but can you just tell us a little bit about the state of media diversity in Australia and why it's important? Well, thanks, uh, Ebony, and um, great to be here with Maria and Andrew as well. Um, Andrew, I know you know this is your uh, your baby, and um, I, I just think it's a fabulous. Uh, kind of collection of, of, of policy ideas um, across the spectrum. And obviously the media one um, is really interesting to me, um, but I'm sure there's um, lots of other things in there that um, uh, other people can, can grab hold of as well. Um, I'm sorry we're not able to do it in person, launching it here in Adelaide. Um, but, you know, those are the times we're in. And I think um, that really uh, brings us to, to one of the key issues of, how we get access to information in a crisis like this, uh, in this pandemic. Um, we've seen uh, more information uh, disseminated than ever before, uh, ways of which information is uh, uh, 
uh, accessed and, and, and published. Um, the variety of that is um, extraordinary now. Um, but all while uh, the issue of uh, media diversity, that kind of uh, the official media sources, you know, trained journalists, um, officially published articles, um, uh, editorial standards that really uphold um, those um, basic kind of principles of journalism. Um, all of that is actually becoming more and more concentrated. And Australia remains uh, one of the most uh, concentrated media landscapes in the world. And that's only gotten worse. It's not just the metropolitan, you know, daily newspapers either. Um, we're talking now um, a significant shift in the concentration of um, regional and rural uh, newspapers, those kind of more local rags. Uh, many of them have been um, bought up by a news corp over the over recent years uh, or um, have been kind of sold off uh, or shut down. So it's just becoming uh, either more syndicated um, or, or just, uh, you know, nothing local um, and, and nothing accessible. Um, this is all happening at a time when uh, the, the, the kind of rivers of gold that used to fund uh, and subsidise news journalism, uh, that is advertising, um, has really uh, changed. It's all moved online. Uh, we've got, you know, Google, Facebook, the, the various different um, tech giants are really controlling the advertising market. And so that has kind of uh, sucked up people's revenue. Um, that leaves us in a situation where we have um, a very small handful of big media companies in this country that do both the daily metro uh, newspapers, the regional uh, newspapers, often syndicated, and then, of course, um, uh, are, are moving into both the, the radio and the television space. Um, I note that uh, only yesterday... Um, uh, the uh, News Corp and, and Murdoch announced that they would be launching a, um, a new streaming service uh, for news. Um, so, you know, again, um, moving into that space to compete um, with, the, you know, with ABC online. Mm. Um, before we get really, I guess, stuck into many more details on media diversity, um, Andrew, could you just tell us a little bit about um, what the Nordic Edge covers and why we created the book? You're on mute there, Andrew. Thank you, Ebony. And uh, Sarah, thank you very much for your participation today. And uh, I think one of the good things that your inquiry has already achieved is to uh, bring about greater scrutiny of misleading claims by Sky News, taking down YouTube videos that were making false claims either about climate change or public health, you name it. Um, and it's the kind of thing that could become more prevalent with greater public accountability. The book has a chapter on media diversity, which is what we're focused on today. Uh, it also has many other ideas that we can learn from, adapt and apply from successful proven Nordic policies. That's policies in Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Norway and Iceland to tackle gender inequality, to tackle climate change, uh, to make progress with uh, skills retraining for displaced workers, to support the rehabilitation of prisoners because that makes everybody safer and very topically an independent foreign policy. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, now, Maria, uh, you helped me write the chapter on media diversity. Uh, and one of the things it examines is um, direct subsidies for uh, newspapers in particular in a couple of countries. But overall, can you just talk to us a little bit about how the Nordic approach to um, making sure that public interest journalism is, is supported? Yeah, thanks very much for that, Ebony. And I think both you and Sarah have really outlined the problems that you can have when you create media monopolies. And the Nordic countries were really progressive in understanding that this was going to be a problem. So way back in the 60s and 70s, um, they brought in direct funding and, and direct press subsidies, which they called press support. So this took a number of forms. Um, one of them was uh, subsidising the second largest newspaper in circulation in each um, city or town, so here in Melbourne, that would probably be the age after the Herald Sun, to ensure that, that, that um, the media were being actively competitive against each other, but also they put a lot of direct funding into um, ensuring that there were new internet startup platforms as well, so they would support new entries into the media field. Um, they would also provide um, direct funding towards um, 
the freight and distribution, and that's become incredibly relevant here in Australia this weekend. The News Corp papers will no longer be uh, delivered in hard copy to regional and rural Queensland. Um, and we've seen um, some news agents have a small win today with actually taking up that freight cost themselves because they realise that newspapers are a public good and that public access is important. Um, so uh, there's also direct funding towards editorial production. So that is employing journalists in those Nordic um, countries as well and supporting First Nations like the Sami people's publications, minority publications. Um, there are also tax exemptions um, or tax breaks in some countries such as Finland, but these uh, have been shown to not be as effective in terms of increasing media diversity as direct funding. Yeah, and so I know that a lot of, I think particularly in Norway, they're just huge newspaper readers and they've got a, a big, very stable system of particularly local newspapers that serve their uh, local regions. Um, Sarah, the government has brought in um, some kind of temporary and one-off subsidies. On the one hand, you've got kind of millions of dollars handed over to Foxtel, for example, uh, or at the other end, you've got kind of the public interest news gathering fund that was announced last year. Um, back in 2012, the Finkelstein report thought that there wasn't a case for government support. Do you think there is now a case? Do you think the government realises it kind of has to step in? Uh, in short answer, yes. And I think, look, since that Finkelstein uh, inquiry and the report came out, um, it was, it was, the situation in Australia has gotten worse. We've gotten, uh, it's gotten more concentrated, uh, less competition, uh, and yet the need for access to local news and news you can trust information that is uh, actually um, bedded in, in, in fact and uh, independent analysis has become, um, you know, just um, more and more necessary. I, I, I just reflect on what's been happening, uh, you know, over the last 18 months here in the midst of COVID. Um, we have daily press conferences from uh, state premiers, um, you, know, <laughs> you know, week in, week out. Um, and hundreds of thousands of people are tuning in and watching those. That is because people want access uh, to information that affects them, that is relevant to their lives, uh, that helps them not just that day, but that week and, and so on and so forth. Um, so people have a um, desperation and a need for access to, um, uh, to, to credible news right now. And yet the situation has become worse in terms of how that's disseminated, how that's um, how that's uh, published, how how uh, the information being put out by by governments and politicians and other leaders uh, is actually being um, uh, scrutinised and and transparent. Um, so yes, the situation has gotten worse, and I think um, if that Finkelstein re uh, report was written today, um, it would be saying not just that we need to monitor, and it's really important here. Um, the report did not acknowledge that things are changing and it said it needed to be watched and mo monitored very carefully. Well, um, here we are watching and monitoring it very carefully and it's quite clear that we do need um, public support to ensure good public interest journalism. And the reason, you know, it's not just enough just to go, oh, well, it's just another media company, you know, maybe you just leave that to the free market, it doesn't matter. Um, the reason that this is important is because Journalism is and of itself a public good. Uh, a public interest journalism, uh, accountability and transparency of government and decision makers is a public good. And I, I found it really interesting reading um, the chapter in the book about how uh, in Nordic countries, uh, the public good of uh, journalism is up there with the public good of the health system or the education system or uh, you know, uh, policing. Um, it's, an, it's kind of seen as uh, an institution of itself uh, that, is, that is worth uh, protecting. And it, of course, feeds into a healthy democracy. And I often um, uh, wonder, um, you know, <laughs> how politicians can keep a straight face when they argue that, when some on the conservative side argue that our public broadcaster needs funding cuts, while at the same time trying to convince the electorate that they should be trusted. And the whole point of having well-funded, uh, good public interest journalism 
is to ensure that our governments are, uh, are held accountable and that there is a responsibility uh, towards transparency. Absolutely. Um, you've made a really good point there um, that I wanted to talk about, and that is the really strong support for public broadcasting in Nordic countries. So as you've said, Sarah, they really view it as kind of a public good. They really value the role that it has um, in terms of uh, a functioning and healthy democracy. And some of the subsidies are allocated on that basis, you know, with that as a specific goal in mind that they want to support it, journalism as a, as a public good. Um, and that doesn't really often, that's not often the way that we talk about the, the media here in Australia, but um, we kind of looked back in this chapter and looked at, um, you know, what's happened to ABC funding. The ABC itself um, had said that, you know, we all know famously in about 1987, the ABC cost Australians about eight cents each day. Um, in 1987 dollar terms now, it gets just four cents a day. So it's halved basically. And if you look at what the Nordic countries uh, are doing, um, if we were to follow their example, say if we looked at how much Finland um, supports their uh, public broadcasters, um, funding would more than double from for the ABC from one just over $1 billion to $2.4 billion a year. And if we look to Norway, the ABC's funding could triple to almost $3.2 billion a year. So there really is um, huge support for public broadcasters in the Nordic countries. And certainly I think um, you touched a little bit, Sarah, on um, disinformation, on the importance of people having news that they can trust. And we certainly know that here in Australia, the ABC is one of the most trusted news organisations in Australia and that trust has only strengthened in recent years. If we look at the role it plays as an emergency broadcaster during things like the Black Summer bushfires, people credited the ABC with saving their lives with up-to-date um, you know, information on what was happening in their area. So it does play a huge role. It's right across the country. It goes into a lot of small regional and remote um, and rural areas as well, which I think is often uh, underplayed in terms of its um, importance. But Sarah, I did want to come back to you on, on the role of the ABC and perhaps a little bit on that idea of disinformation as well. Mm -hmm. Some of the Nordic countries um, uh, have different funding models for public broadcasting, but they're all commonly um, you know, much more generous, I guess, than, than what Australia is at the moment. Um, what's your thoughts on the recent funding cuts to the ABC and how important public broadcasters like SBS and NITV are going to be in the future if we're going to be combating you know, massive dis disinformation campaigns as we've seen throughout the pandemic? Well, I think it's essential. And um, I might just pull you up on one thing. The ABC is the most trusted news source uh, in the country. Um, it's one of the most trusted public institutions in the country. Uh, but when it comes to, to news and information, it, it is um, streets ahead of other news uh, companies and agencies. Um, and that's only increased. Uh, uh, in fact, significantly since 2014 to today, um, the, the level of public trust in the ABC continues to rise, which I find ironic considering the a massive amount of um, kind of undermining of the public broadcaster that we get, uh, that you know, I witness uh, on a regular basis uh, in the uh, you know, political biff uh, of, uh, of Canberra and Parliament House. Um, but uh, it's, uh, you know, the public don't buy that. They, they know it's trustworthy. Uh, they tune in. And you're right about this element of uh, when crisis hits. Um, there was, uh, you know, during the bushfires, people tuned in enormously, but COVID they have as well. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, uh, Dr Swan uh, on ABC has become, you know, the, the, the go-to on uh, breaking down the lingo uh, in relation to the health restrictions and information and uh, really helping everyday Australians to understand what's going on and they can feel trusted um, uh, that, uh, that what they get is, is correct. Um, the ABC funding cuts are a problem though. 
um, you're right about this issue of, um, you know, in, in, real, in, in kind of dollar terms, um, the funding has gone backwards, backwards, backwards. Uh, it was in 2013 in the, uh, on the eve of the election when uh, Tony Abbott promised no budget cuts to the ABC and then in 2014 budget, um, a big whack uh, at the ABC. Uh, we're still feeling those budget cuts uh, today. Um, and uh, I know as, as we're sitting here um, having this conversation, uh, the ABC um, are um, going to be uh, negotiating very shortly uh, with the government for their next round of triennial funding because that's due uh, in the next in the next budget. Um, I uh, I really hope that we're not looking down the barrel of uh, either on the eve of an election um, uh, funding cuts being announced to our public broadcaster, or indeed worse than that, um, you know, if uh, the Morrison government is returned. Uh, you know, um, promises and that are then broken uh, in the budget um, after the election. Um, the ABC can't, they simply can't handle um, any more budget cuts and frankly neither can, the, uh, can SBS. Um, they've done an enormous job uh, in the relation of um, breaking down uh, and confronting disinformation, particularly during COVID and getting to those kind of um, uh, multicultural communities across Australia uh, and getting information out in a way that they understand uh, and how important uh, the health restrictions and, and response uh, to COVID has been. Um, you balance all this with then uh, uh, what's been going on on the Murdoch platform of Sky News. And Andrew mentioned it before that through our inquiry, um, we've, we put a spotlight on disinformation that was coming out of uh, Sky News and particularly out of some of their uh, the shows by presenters such as Alan Jones. Um, and as a result of that, uh, several uh, episodes have been deleted entirely from Sky News's platform now. Of course, there was the, the ban, um, the short-term ban on Sky News from uh, YouTube and Google because they were worried that this was breaching uh, some of this information that was being put out uh, kind of around vaccinations and, uh, and misinformation about masks. Uh, and others uh, was breaching uh, Google's own uh, policies when it came to uh, COVID misinformation. Now, I've I, I got to ask, I'm not a big fan of Google. I'm not a big fan of the tech giants, but why on earth was it left to a big tech giant to have to pull up uh, the socks uh, and, uh, and, and raise the alarm when it came to disinformation on uh, Sky News? Um, and of course, uh, what we see when we look about at the, the impact of a monopoly like the Murdoch Press is that not only do we have uh, this information now being broadcast on Sky News on a subscription service, but it is now being broadcast on a free-to-air service in many parts of regional Australia through Win News um, or Win TV. So um, there is this uh, constant kind of tension between needing to support the public broadcaster because uh, it's, it's important for any democracy to have a strong, well-funded public broadcaster. But on the other hand, you still need good competition, uh, diversity and support and, I might say, um, regulations that are robust enough to hold um, the other commercial uh, media companies to account. It's quite clear when it comes to the disinformation coming out of some of the Murdoch um, Empire platforms, particularly Sky News, that the Australian um, media uh, regulator, the AMCA, are just not up to the job uh, of holding them to account. So we need proper regulation as well as uh, funding models. Yeah, um, I can see we've got about 740 people on the line with us. Thanks so much uh, for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. We are talking about media diversity and lessons that we might be able to learn from the Nordic countries. Um, Maria, I'll come back to you. Sarah kind of touched on there um, the role that Google and YouTube have played in addressing regulation. But of course, last year, Australia was so... Oh, when was it? All my dates are getting confused. The news media blackout from Facebook. Um, as part of the discussions uh, Australia had in sometimes world leading um, legislation on the news media bargaining code, uh, we had a blackout um, from some of the big tech companies. And I think a lot of commercial broadcasters in Australia like to blame the ABC for competing with them for advertising dollars. But a lot of inquiries have really found that it is 
the big tech companies, Facebook and Google, who are eating up all that digital advertising revenue. How important is regulation um, in terms of, uh, you know, a strong media sector? Thanks for that question, Ebony. Yeah, it's definitely um, been a challenge for mainstream media organisations having these big tech companies come on the scene. And um, it was quite surprising, I think, to see that regulation come in and the response from Facebook as well. It obviously saw us as a test case for what might go on um, around the world. And it's troubling because um, especially young people, uh, the um, University of Canberra do a digital news report every year that shows more and more people, um, particularly young people, source their news from social media. And they do it as they're using it for other means as well. So uh, if we don't have that on social media, it means that many people are then not engaging with any forms of news. They're not sitting down to watch the traditional um, TV bulletin every night. So we do need it as another platform, but it does need to contribute, I think, um, to the local media as well in terms of its advertising because it really is bleeding that dry. Now, in terms of how this regulation um, plays out, I'd be really interested to hear from Sarah about how effective she thinks it might be. I know there's been some criticisms that it will actually just really help um, fill the large um, media organisations' pockets even more and uh, local news and regional news will still, um, because they're not shared as much, online they'll still miss out and that it might be quite technically difficult to regulate. I think media regulation is always particularly tricky because um, we do hear this freedom of the press which um, means that the government should have too much regulation of them and we start to think about authoritarian countries. Um, so we, we need to have a fine balance there between how do we regulate, uh, especially against misinformation. I know that uh, Germany are probably leading uh, the world here in terms of um, you know, um, financially um, sanctioning companies that um, put up fake news like Facebook, if they don't remove it or, or hate speech within uh, 24 hours and they're financially sanctioned, um, it's very difficult to enforce that kind of regulation though, but I think it certainly does play a role. Mm. Um, we might come back to you in a little bit, Sarah, um, just to respond on some of those news media bargaining code and regulation things. But Andrew, we'll go soon to questions from the audience. Um, I did just wanna come back to you. We've touched on kind of um, a lot of issues here and some of that touches on other things we discuss in the book. Um, I guess, what are your thoughts on where we go from here? Well, I think first of all, obviously public subsidies and more funding of a public broadcaster costs money which requires revenue for government. And so it does connect to issues of tax and whether we have enough of it and whether we have it fairly levied, including on the mining of our natural resources. So I think we do have a chapter in the book on raising enough revenue to invest in public goods, including journalism. The other striking thing is that public subsidies for newspapers in Norway do not mean at all stifling of press freedom. The most striking thing is that Norway is actually the number one on the World Press Freedom Index. It has the most elaborate system of public support for newspapers. The Nordic countries have the top four position on the World Press Freedom, Freedom Index. Australia is number 26. Um, Andrew, I'm just having a little bit of trouble hearing you there. Have you... Sorry. Yeah, that might is that, be better. Is that better? Sorry, I'm not sure we, at which point I drifted out there, but um, uh, Norway is top of the World Press Freedom Index, despite having the most elaborate system of public subsidies for newspapers. So it doesn't stifle press freedom. The Nordic countries are the top four on the global press freedom index. Australia is number 26. The revenue is there to support these investments through fair taxation. And Sweden now has a media ombudsman, a permanent ombudsman. And the, ombud, the term om, ombudsman is in fact a, an old Norse word, which we, we're very familiar with in the English language. And we don't just have ombudsman for people with issues of government. Generally, we have children's commissioners or ombudsmen. We have, now have a media ombudsman in Sweden. And I think they're things that are talked about in the chapter, which are all relevant to what we're discussing. Mm, thank you. Um, we might go to questions from the audience just shortly, but Sarah, I did want to come back to you. Um, the News Media Bargaining Code, um, you know, obviously kind of very world leading legislation. Um, how's that going? Where's that up to? Um, thanks, Ed. Yes, this, of course, was to address the fact that uh, it's these big media call, uh, social media companies and the tech giants who are kind of hoovering up all of the revenue, which is leaving the rest of the media 
uh, kind of traditional media um, uh, in Australia with very little uh, revenue source. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's legislation uh, in there to try and um, push Google and Facebook to negotiate with Australian media companies. Um, that is happening. Um, Google and Facebook have both struck deals uh, with um, the, a, a vast array of Australia's um, media companies who have got, you know, the kind of the, the bigger ones, of course, uh, the daily newspapers, uh, the TVs and uh, radio stations. Um, I worked very hard uh, and the Greens worked very hard in the parliament at the time to make sure ABC and SBS, so our public broadcasters, were uh, involved in that because I was worried uh, that um, if they're not uh, if, if they're not in that. So, um, you know, they, the, the public actually um, uh, miss out when we know that actually some of the most important information to be disseminated is the, the quality news uh, content that's coming from ABC and SBS. So they are now included in the code, which is good. Um, and, uh, and both of them have negotiated uh, deals with um, uh, Google and Facebook. Um, but I think what's important is some of those uh, more uh, diverse and smaller publishers. So we're talking uh, the Saturday paper, crikey, um, uh, junkie media, um, a bunch of those smaller players, which um, tend to go, going to Maria's point, uh, feed content directly into uh, um, onto the phones and the tablets and, and into the news feeds of uh, younger Australians, um, those uh, companies have all struck up deals uh, with uh, under this code as well, which I think is really important because um, when we talk about diversity and making sure that uh, we do something about this monopoly of the Murdoch press, which I'm incredibly uh, concerned about, and I know so many Australians are, you know, half, more than half a million people signed a petition um, put together by Kevin Rudd in relation to this. People understand that a media monopoly is not a good thing for democracy. Um, so you need these other smaller players and, uh, and they now are benefiting from this code as well, which is, which is good. Um, I know there's an argument that, you know, that some of this money gets, you know, goes back into big companies like uh, News Corp and, and Nine and elsewhere. Um, but, uh, you know, those companies were so big anyway that they were going to subsidise themselves while and cannibalise the rest of the industry. Smaller players uh, who offer diversity, a diversity of voice, a diversity of reach, um, accessibility to uh, particularly younger uh, audiences, which is essential uh, for keeping a healthy democracy. Um, those players were just were, were falling off the wagon because they simply couldn't sustain themselves. Uh, so this is a good step forward for them. Mm. Um... I've got a, there's a lot of questions covering a lot of different areas in here. Um, but Andrew, I'm going to come to you for this first one. It's from Grace McCallum, who says that uh, they've lived in Sweden for most of their adult life, only returning to Australia last year during, due, due to the pandemic. And the observation that Sweden and Australia are very different society systems and people is aiming for a Nordic approach, good in theory, but impractical um, in other senses. What would your response be to that? Well, there, there are many differences, but there are many similarities too. And uh, we talk a lot about globalization and learning from the, the highest achieving countries. Now, Sweden doesn't achieve everything perfectly, but it achieves a lot well. And we've already adopted many Swedish type policies, including paid parental leave. It was invented in Sweden in 1974. We've got on a, on a much lesser basis, however, than Sweden, which where it's 16 months per family of which a father must take th three months minimum. Now, this all helps uh, make it a different society. Policies change society. So Sweden has many more women in full-time jobs, 20 percentage points higher than Australia because they get the time off when they need it and they go back into the workforce and don't lose careers and salaries. So policies can move us in that direction. We won't transplant Stockholm to the Yarra River, no, but we can move uh, with careful policies that tackle real problems in Australia, I think. Yeah. Um, Sarah, there's a couple of people in the questions asking about um, Rupert Murdoch and the Murdoch media. So someone's mentioned that um, apparently Scott Morrison met with Rupert Murdoch yesterday in New York and 
Um, shouldn't he be called on to inform us of what was discussed? But a lot of other people touching on uh, the big petition um, that Kevin Rudd, former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd and Malcolm Turnbull talked about last year. I believe Kevin Rudd talked about um, the Murdoch media being uh, a cancer. Um, uh, what's your response? People are wanting to know what happened to that petition and, mm. and what's happening on that issue in, in general. Um, yes, look, people are very interested in this issue. And I think that's, uh, I think that's um, credit to the way Australians um, uh, perceive uh, uh, monopolies in this country, but particularly uh, media monopolies. Um, just to um, make it clear, my understanding is the um, uh, Scott Morrison didn't meet with Rupert Murdoch. He met with the CEO of, of News Corp and had dinner with him last night, um, Robert Thompson. So, uh, it, yes, I'd be very interested to know what they were talking about as well. Um, uh, I suspect, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, as we, you know, lots of prime ministers in the past have met with Rupert Murdoch and, and the heads of News Corp over the years in the lead up to elections. So um, it'd be a very interesting to know what happens out of that. Um, but I, but this goes to the point of, about, about what type of influence and the um, extreme uh, monopoly that the uh, that that News Corporation and the Murdoch, Murdoch Empire has on media. Uh, here in Australia, but not just here in Australia, of course, we've seen the um, impact of uh, news, uh, news corp in relation to Fox News in the US and the impact that that had on um, the last two US elections and the impact that it had on uh, the um, presidency of Donald Trump. Um, but back here, I, yes, People signed over a million, over half a million people signed a petition that was put up by Kevin Rudd, uh, calling for uh, a royal commission into media diversity and, in particular, uh, the impact of the monopoly of of Murdoch. Uh, and um, that is really what um, spurred me into action to set up the Senate inquiry, uh, because I could not, uh, I, I couldn't ignore the fact that so many Australians had raised concerns that had, you know, had participated in what was an official parliamentary petition. Uh, the rest of the parliament wasn't gonna do much about it. So we set up um, our inquiry. And I must say, it's been um, a very, very good process. I think it has uh, put a spotlight on uh, the issue of media diversity. It's picked up many of the themes in, in the chapter in this book that we talked about today, but it's also um, really putting some transparency and a spotlight on uh, what is happening within the Murdoch uh, empire, uh, whether it's through uh, the daily newspapers, the online platforms, or indeed, uh, and the kind of foxification, as some people refer to it, of Sky News here in Australia. Um, uh, that inquiry uh, will be winding up, um, will be, we'll be reporting towards the end of the year. We've got um, a lot of work to do to get some of those um, recommendations together. Um, but I don't think this issue is going to go away anytime soon. I mean, I, I fundamentally believe that um, some of those reasons for a Royal Commission are, are very valid. And um, the influence of the Murdoch press on uh, politics is extraordinary. And Kevin Rudd uh, referenced it as um, being a cancer uh, on politics and democracy. Um, other people have uh, described it in similar terms. Um, you've got to remember when um, there was a big uh, inquiry in the UK after uh, uh, the Murdoch press was involved in the phone hacking uh, affair, uh, they were referred to as, as behaving like, uh, you know, uh, the mafia and the mob, um, basically calling the shots and no one being able to hold them accountable, not even politicians. Um, I think there's a lot we can learn, not just from uh, past history, but uh, recent times about the influence the Murdoch press is having. Um, look at climate change. Uh, one of the issues we've done, uh, we've covered in our inquiry is the impact of reporting of climate change and climate denialism uh, across the Murdoch press. Uh, and uh, there is no doubt uh, that that has held back climate policy uh, in this country for a long time. It's interesting to note that um, in the coming month, we're being told that the that News Corp is going to be launching a campaign, I say in inverted commas, um, on, on climate change. Um, that is because the public uh, have, have pushed 
and have pushed back that it is just simply not acceptable anymore uh, to, to continue to purport uh, climate denialism and, uh, and delay. So um, they're moving because the public is demanding better. Mm. Um, I just wanted to bring up here, Jane King uh, has put, it's not a, a question, but has commented um, in the questions that uh, they were successful recipients of the 2019 and 2020 Regional and Small Publishers Innovation Fund, which enabled their mastheads to upscale and increase their public interest journalism output. I'm delighted to hear about that, um, Jane. And Maria, I might ask you there, um, you know, when we were writing this chapter, uh, there was kind of a couple of one-off funds set up, particularly in response to newsrooms closing during the pandemic. Um, but going back to that idea of subsidies, um, in the Nordic countries, you know, they go in with some clear objectives, either to um, support uh you know, the second biggest newspaper, or it might be culturally and linguistically diverse papers, or to make sure a particular rural or remote area has access to news. Is it time that Australia started looking at more systematic and permanent subsidies, you know, that adhere to some obvious criteria? Thanks, Ebony. Yes, definitely. And I think um, what Sarah was saying about, particularly during times of crisis, um, that's when you realise how important local and regional news is and a diversity of news. And, and last year, we did see a massive spike in people consuming news. Um, and also, um, but having trust issues with news as well. So, you know, 65% of Australians were saying that they were really concerned about misinformation, but we actually have a very low media literacy rate here in Australia compared to other countries. So that's a problem that we're worried about fake news or misinformation, but we can't actually always detect it. And, and that's been attributed, I think, to a lack of diversity. And, and that's really what the Nordic countries are trying to target with their criteria. So they're not trying to also, through these kind of direct subsidies, um, and I was so delighted with that, Jane, they're trying to make the media geographically diverse. So you're having, and I'm from Tasmania, so I'm, I'm still excited that there's still three newspapers down there servicing half a million people. And, uh, and, and there should be diversity in rural and regional areas as well as um, the cities as well. So part of that is to be geographically diverse. A another criteria is to be, is that you need any media or platform or organisation needs to have some um, news and current affairs content. So they're not just subsidising any kind of entertainment uh, online platform, for example. There has to be an element of, of news and, um, and it also has to go towards directly funding journalists. So it's about increasing the number of journalists in newsrooms as well. Uh, and again, yeah, being culturally um, and ideologically diverse as well. So that also means perhaps funding media organisations that you whose views you might not agree with, but at least you're listening to different views from the left to the right spectrum. Hmm. Um, the next question I've got here is from Ronald Smith, and it's probably one for you again, Sarah. He says, why does the Fairfax Media, now nine, allow Clive Palmer to peddle his ideas in full page advertising when he and uh, Mr Kelly, I'm assuming he means Craig there, would probably consider the Sydney Morning Herald um, fake news. You've already touched a little bit on disinformation. We've already talked about, I guess, um, you know, that a lot of media companies are really struggling um, for revenue. What's your response there? I think we've all seen those ads, if we haven't already got a text. As, as well. <laughs> um, look, it's a good question. I've been thinking about this a lot lately about um, what is the uh, social responsibility and community responsibility of media companies. It's not just um, what they report uh, and making sure that they have to report um, uh, accurately and uh, ensure that uh, it, it's truthful and be responsible for that. But uh, in terms of the the type of advertising that, that they get, and you know, I've seen those, you know, those, those Clive Palmer uh, Craig Kelly adds that a, a, a big strip along the front page of the newspaper saying, you know, uh, which are making it harder and harder for uh, our health officials to do their job. Uh, that's on the bottom as a, you know, kind of attacking uh, the health response. And then there's an article about how many uh, people have got COVID and, and the, the stress on hospitals that day in the news article. I mean, it's, it, it is, um, uh, it, it, it's kind of 
um, chalk and cheese. Um, there is a responsibility for um, our media proprietors to um, uh, publish uh, responsible information. The problem we have um, is that there is a difference between advertising and uh, reporting. Um, so it's, it's not as easy. Uh, but I do think that the um, expectation uh, and the frustration with the Australian community of the Australian community towards disinformation is growing, becoming more cynical uh, and frustrated. And I think these media companies are going to start uh, to feel the wrath of, uh, of the audience, uh, frankly, in relation to this. Um, I come back again uh, to the role of our regulators in this. Uh, the um, ACMA, the AMCA, uh, their, their job uh, in relation to advertising, their job in relation to um, overseeing accurate reporting, um, uh, it, it, it's all fine on paper, but effectively they've got no teeth. Um, very much of Australia's media uh, and reporting uh, and the kind of media industry is self-regulated. We've got the Press Council, we've got ACMA, which is uh, government, but still the rules have effectively kind of left to the media companies to, to, to hold themselves to account. And it, it staggers me that if you have a complaint against something that was broadcast, for example, on uh, you know, Craig Kelly talking to, to Alan Jones on Sky News, um, you have to, uh, if, if you raise this with the regulator, uh, the regulator tells you to go and raise it with Sky News and they will just wait to see whether Sky News say something back to you. And if, you, if you're not happy, then you have to go back to the regulator and raise it again. It's this, this um, if, if you wanted to set up a system that stops media companies being held accountable, this is what you would do. Um, it's time that we actually overhauled uh, and looked at what other uh, countries like the Nordic countries are doing in relation to these issues. And I think this is a, a fair deal. Uh, we've got media companies having their hand out uh, for public subsidies and public money. Uh, Foxtel has been given $40 million of public money. So don't argue about the fact that you know, the ABC gets public money. They're a public broadcaster. We've got private companies with their hand out for millions of dollars. We've got newspapers who are being uh, supported and should be supported uh, to, to sustain themselves in um, areas where we need diversity. Um, but the flip side of that should be um, better regulation and ensuring that there is uh, some accountability with the accuracy of news. Mm. Um, I can see a couple of um, comments and questions around uh, where... Um, and the sample size, for, uh, for example, of polling that shows that the ABC is the most trusted news source. Uh, I think, believe you can get that from the ABC itself in its annual report. Uh, the Australia Institute has polled that several times. You can probably find that on our website somewhere as well. Uh, and I'm absolutely certain we're not the only ones uh, who have polled it. Generally speaking, the national polls, representative samples uh, of the community so you can uh, find those online um, and other people are kind of um, yeah asking about uh, Sarah that idea of a media ombudsman and is that being considered mm. in Australia just a quick follow-up to kind of what you were talking about before. Yes I think this links to the issue of um, our government regulator having no teeth and effectively the, um, the press council um, uh, being um, very kind of you know toothless when it comes to dealing with issues, um, I, I think there is um, some merit in, in the in the role of the ombudsman um, in the Nordic countries. And again, I come back to the point: um, we need to be supporting uh, public interest journalism because it is a public good. Uh, so, okay, let's find some uh, you know ways to to fund this through the subsidies or tax incentives or. Uh, uh, other mechanisms that is uh, and, and the levers that government has, uh, but the flip side of that needs to be that the public has to be certain uh, that uh, there is uh, a social good uh, and a responsibility hand in hand uh, with those media companies. Um, I've got a next question here from Blair Williams, who says gender is often not talked about in conversations of media ownership and the negative ramifications of a Murdoch dominated media landscape and that their research shows the Murdoch press coverage of women in politics is more gendered um, or sexist and normalizes this kind of discourse. The question is what can be done to regulate this kind of language and coverage and how can we encourage 
more women to enter politics. Sarah, I might add a question onto that as well for you. Um, obviously, you've had your uh, own terrible experiences in Parliament and sometimes through the press as well. But I really noticed, um, particularly with a lot more senior women journalists in the press gallery, there was a real difference to me in the coverage of, for example, Brittany Higgins' allegations than um, you know, than we've seen uh, in the past. What is, what's your response to some of those mm. questions, I guess? Mm. Well, firstly, just on that, I think that's correct. I think the more women we have uh, reporting on uh, politics and holding uh, and decision makers uh, to account through uh, media and, and transparency, um, uh, of course, it comes with a, with, with, um, a more diverse lens. And I think the Brittany Higgins, uh, the way the Brittany Higgins um, issue has been reported, uh, by female members of the press gallery and outside the press gallery as well, um, uh, I think uh, shows a change. Um, we've actually touched on this issue of uh, the way uh, News Corporation in particular, but not just News Corp, other big uh, media agencies, uh, just depict women uh, in their news articles. We had a whistleblower from um, uh, News Corp papers, a, a, a photojournalist, um, present to the inquiry and she spoke um, in great detail about the types of directions she was given about the types of pictures she had to uh, shoot what would what would cut uh, uh, what would get kind of you know up the list uh, in terms of editorial decisions um, you know there's um, it, it was extraordinary actually hearing directly from her um, as to the way uh, not just women are spoken about in terms of um, uh, you know, subject of stories, but yes, very, very clear and deliberate uh, decisions being made about how they were physically uh, portrayed in pictures, which was very, if anyone's interested in that, go back and, um, and have a look at the, the record um, from that day. Um, her name was Anna Rogers, uh, the photojournalist who presented. Um, I also um, uh, think, of course, though, that, if, you know, that, just like getting more women into politics uh, is, uh, is better for ensuring a diversity of conversation and, uh, and approach. Uh, it's the same in, 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 in journalism and across the media agencies. Might just do a shout out, uh, whoever that was, I'm sorry, um, uh, the, the questioner, Ebony, I've, I've, the Blair. name has escaped me, um, Blair. Um, but uh, the uh, AAP, which is um, Australia's only independent newswire, is now uh, run uh, the only media company in the country to be to have both a female CEO and a female editor. Um, so um, and they're really breaking new ground in that domain as well, which I think is great. Yeah, thank you, um, Andrew. I might just come to you finally. Um, just, I think in the book itself, uh, it does touch on gender in a number of ways. We've talked a little bit about it in media specifically, but we recently spoke to uh, the former Swedish foreign minister, uh, Margot Wallström. She wrote a chapter on feminist foreign policy. Um, uh, can you just tell us what else people might find interesting in the book if they're interested in issues of gender and, and perhaps a reminder of the other, the other chapters that are covered? Thanks, Ebony. Uh, yes, the... What uh, black available in all good bookshops at the moment. <laughs> yes, and do support bookshops because bookshops are doing it very tough in uh, lockdown and you can still do click and collect purchases or call and collect and fit it into your daily exercise. Ring <laughs> up, uh, order the Nordic egg, go and pick it up. Um, in that book, you'll find a chapter on gender budgeting, something Australia invented in the 1980s and one of the people participating in that was Marion Saw, who's co-written the chapter, and then stopped subsequently, whereas the Nordic countries kept it going. And gender budgeting means that decisions cannot be made with major financial implications before the impact they have on gender inequality is taken into account. So one of those decisions would be income tax cuts for rich people, 90% of whom are men, for example. So gender budgeting is one big thing. Feminist foreign policy is another. Margot Volstrom told us what Sweden's done to tackle the fact that one in every five girls in the world under the age of 18 is married and all the bad implications that has for women's possibilities. We've seen the shocking behaviour and standards in Australian national politics. The co-author of Marion's chapter on gender budgeting is Lanita Friedenvale, who's advised the Swedish parliament on gender equality. Um, I think the Australian parliament could probably 
do with some advice from her as well, uh, Barnaby Joyce and others. I mean, he could get the advice, not give it. Um, and, uh, all the points about gender equality in the Nordic countries, uh, they're the global leaders in that respect. Four, four female prime ministers of all the five Nordic countries currently. Um, the Swedish male prime minister recently resigned and is likely to be replaced by a woman, which would have made it five out of five. But the bad news is that the Norwegian election produced a male prime minister. The good news is that he's a progressive from a left of centre coalition and he's very interested in tackling climate change. And the Finnish uh, coalition government is a five party coalition. And guess what? All five party leaders are women. And one of the first decisions they made was to extend paternity leave uh, following Iceland and Sweden's extensions. Um, and they're the kind of policies we could get with more women in politics in Australia. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. And yeah, I will just note, um, there's a couple of uh, other women authors in um, the book, not just Maria and myself and Marianne Soar, um, but Audrey Quick has written, written an excellent um, chapter on electric vehicles. Um, Norway leads the way there. So uh, lots of great uh, chapter authors in the book. Um, we are gonna have to wrap it up there. I'm really sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions. There's a lot of great ones in there, but thank you so much for your time today, Sarah, and um, and good luck with the rest of the uh, inquiry. And um, thank you personally for the stand that you've made for women in parliament and in general. Uh, I think it has made a real difference. Um, thanks, Maria, my chapter co-author, and to Andrew, co-editor of uh, the book, The Nordic Edge, as he mentioned, available in all good bookshops, do support your local. I got mine from Paper Chain in Marnica. I hope all the books are still on the shelves after this morning's, thankfully, <laughs> teeny tiny earthquake. I wanna thank everyone. I think we had uh, close to 750 people on uh, the webinar with us today. Thanks so much for your interest in this. Uh, it is an important issue and thanks for all your great questions. Um, next week, uh, we will have our regular fortnightly poll position webinar with Guardian Australia and Essential Media. As I mentioned, that'll cover the new nuclear submarines deal. And please don't forget to subscribe to Follow the Money, our podcast. This week, I talked to Ben Oquist, our executive director, as well as Alan Beam, head of our international and security affairs program about all the implications of that nuclear submarines deal. Um, it's going to cost us an absolute bomb. We don't know the total cost yet. And obviously, we're already seeing some of the um, fallout from the way that that deal has been handled. Um, there's a long way to go in that debate all of which was pretty much um, sprung on the public with, you know, without any democratic debate whatsoever. So it's a good one. That's Follow the Money. You can find that on all good podcast platforms, wherever you normally listen to podcasts. Thank you so much, Sarah, Andrew and Maria for your time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank you. Uh, stay safe out there, everyone. Get vaccinated as soon as you can and take care of yourselves. See you soon. Bye.